Hello, my name is Melissa Lane. I am the Health and Temperance Leader for the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in Saginaw. Good morning. My name is Bobby Porter, and I'm the Health and Temperance Leader for the Flint, Michigan, Fairhaven SDA Church. Welcome. We're so thankful that you guys came to join us today. Yes, thank you for joining us. Today we, we will be discussing depression, which is the first topic of our four-part series this month. Next week, we will be discussing suicide. And in the last two weeks, we'll be discussing um, anxiety and addictions. All four heavy, very heavy topics, but we believe the Lord will lead us and direct us. We will be playing a video with Dr. Jeff Baker that discusses uh, that gives us an introduction of depression, gives us more information as far as what are the symptoms of depression, how does it manifest in one's behavior. We know that during this time, especially during with COVID, a lot of things have um, elevated um, as far as our anxiety. So let's go ahead and play the video. You know, depression is more than just being sad. It's not like having that moment of kind of you're in a funk, you know, for a little while. It's not like that at all. Depression is actually very clinically defined. When you have a, a two weeks or more where your mood is depressed, you're just really sad and deflated. Or like if you're a man, men tend to have more of an agitated depression where they're very irritable. And then all of a sudden their eating pattern changes, their sleeping pattern changes. They're not sleeping enough, or they're sleeping all the time, or they're not eating enough, or they're eating all the time, the weight loss, weight gain. Then all of a sudden they lose the pleasure and the things that used to give them pleasure, they used to enjoy. Their, their concentration is poor, decision-making, uh, focus, attention. And then thoughts of death, even being directly suicidal. So when you see all these clinical signs happening for uh, two, three weeks, that is called depression. Very, very different than sadness. Sadness is important and should be there. Depression is not. It is a neurochemical dysfunction. Now, three things happen. People end up living life through like a lens where they start seeing themselves in a very negative way. They start seeing people out there in a very negative way, and they start seeing their future in a very negative way. The three distortions that, that happen, these lenses, one lens is like a lens where I see myself as worthless. Another lens is I look into my future and I don't see hope. And hopelessness is very dangerous. It has a high correlation to suicide. And the other, which is devastating, is helpless. That no matter what I do, nothing's going to make a difference. These are debilitating. And they have a progressive effect. And typically, uh, once people enter into this type of clinical depression, they're going to need help. And they're going to need help professionally. So why does this happen? How, how do people end up depressed? Well, the effect is uh, kind of a combination of the interaction of nature and nurture. It's a little bit about my vulnerability uh, genetically and how I'm relating to a stressful environment, which life has always has those challenges. So what begins to happen as I enter life stressfully and I start flooding my brain with stress hormones because I, I bump my pulse above 100 and I'm dumping stress hormones into my brain. And if I start doing that often enough and frequently enough, according to how genetically vulnerable I am, I begin to deplete my neurotransmitters. Now, here's how this works. These are neurons. And you know it's always good to bring your brain cells to work. So I've brought mine. And these two brain cells work like this. So uh, an electrical information stimulates the dendrites in my brain. 
And what happens is information will be stimulated here, travel down this axion sheath and come out these terminals. Now what will happen, this brain cell is here, okay, and there's a little cleft, a space in between, and that's where neurotransmitters are. And there'll be an electrical arc go from one to the other that will send that message from this dendrite down to this axion and out this terminal to the next one and on and on it goes. Here's the problem. What if this electrical message starts being weak or non-existence? Or it's not ever gonna be non-existence otherwise I'm dead. But what happens when it becomes very weak because that which is the transmitters of this electrical arc is not working because I've depleted that neurotransmitter of serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, whichever ones, because I dump such toxic levels of stress hormones into my brain. That's what depression is. Depression is when my neurotransmitters aren't uh, bountiful and, and enough to create a strong message to allow one neuron to talk to another. Therefore, I end up with all those symptoms which are neurobiologically driven. So to fix this situation, I need to do two things. Number one, I can start boosting this naturally with, with things like doing positive uh, activities and reducing all the negative things in my life. Things as simple as exercise might help, although exercise is a much better prevention to depression than fixer. Typically, once I get there, I may not be able to turn this around naturally. Uh, most often and most readily, what I prescribe to my patients is they see their primary care physician and we look at antidepressants. And that antidepressant's job is to boost that neurotransmitter to get that real strong signal again. And if you start taking your antidepressants in about six weeks, that begins to happen. The other thing that has to happen in concert with that is psychotherapy, where we look at how you're living your life. And two things need to happen. We need to relearn how we're relating to life so we're not stressing ourselves out so bad. Therefore, stop dumping all these stress hormones into our brain. And the other thing is, let's say we do that we we're we're not going to live such a conflicted life uh most the, most of the time people live a conflicted life by doing two things they make their life miserable by lots of self-criticism and self-denial they deny themselves to do nice things for themselves okay they won't pat themselves on their back or, or buy themselves anything not nice or meet their emotional needs or ask for their emotional needs when they when they feel them or again, they're so self-critical, so they, they tell themselves I don't deserve it and they beat themselves up all the time. They make their life very, very difficult and life is difficult already. So when they do this, let's say psychotherapy helps me not do that and I have much better system of self-care and self-compassion. Well, one of the things that can happen is if I've been depressed for a long period of time, I can learn very, very bad habits. And so even though my neurotransmitters have been fixed, they're, they're bountiful, everything's firing, I'm getting this great electrical charge chemically from one nerve cell to another, I still have bad habits in terms of how I believe life works or even how I'm living, my behavioral function. I'm no longer behaviorally activating good motions. I'm kind of living a life, waiting for life to make me feel good, very passively, which never ever happens. Uh, most of the time what we do to create good moods in our life is we behaviorally activate them. We do the things and in a few minutes those things help us feel good and boost our moods, like music and, and talking with our friends and doing fun activities. So these bad habits need to be addressed so that while I have boosted my neurochemistry back to a healthy level, I now can either re-engage the habits I used to, or for some people, it's learning habits they've never developed. So one of the complications in trying to help people with depression is the idea of medication. Now, uh, medication by itself has a high degree of relapse in that People can take the medication, but they've done nothing to change their life 
style that got them there. Another issue is that the habits that they developed while being depressed can maintain itself. Therefore, just taking the medication by itself, people often find that it doesn't work very long. Some of those habits uh, can be things like believing that you're worthless, believing that life is hopeless, believing life is helpless or that I'm helpless, or that uh, you practice high levels of self-criticism and you kind of live in your head uh, of uh, uh, ongoing self-criticism and self-denial where I don't permit myself to ask for the emotional things that I need. I don't make those requests of my friends and family because I don't deserve it. So those kinds of habits create tremendous pressure on me and stress, and therefore I never get ahead because I'm constantly dumping stress hormones in my brain. Some people would want to believe that God should be enough. Well, I'm a believer that I am more than a spirit. I also have a, a body and a soul. So there are, to me, when I think about the, the, the bigger picture, okay, I want to do the things that are healthy for all parts of me. I believe prayer has to be part of that recovery and start believing what God said to be about me rather than all the awful things I say about me. So I believe part of that renewing of my mind has to happen. And, and one of those biggest is hope. We say the three things that last forever, one of them is hope. Well, what if I feel hopeless? Well, certainly part of the renewing of my mind, part of me getting my head around my faith is starting to have hope again and believing that I'm not helpless and that there's, that there's a path for me with somebody who's bigger and more powerful than me that cares deeply about me. And, and if I'm willing to lean into that, that begins to have a direct confrontation on those beliefs. But I may not be very good at knowing how or by what process uh, one renews their mind. You know, I went to Bible college and I heard a lot about renewing their minds the whole four years I was there, but not one person told me how. They drove me crazy. I think I, maybe I drove them crazy because I kept asking, okay, professor, I should renew my mind. How exactly does one do that? And I said, well, you read your Bible. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm in Bible college. I'm reading the Bible more than anybody on the planet right now because that's all I'm doing. But, you know, I'm still thinking like a crazy person. So how do, do you actually renew your mind? That's actually a complicated process that's called cognitive behavioral therapy where we help people learn a process to challenge their beliefs. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real science to help people learn those skills. So, you know, depression is the most common reason people seek uh, a therapist or a psychologist. And one of the questions is, am I depressed? How do I know that just uh, maybe I'm just sad or I'm kind of in that funk or in that kind of stage? And I, I think to help people differentiate that, it's a, it's a lot more than just distress. So when I think of the three Ds, one of them is distress where I don't feel right, but the other is that I'm behaving very abnormally. It's, I am deviant than average, meaning I'm sleeping more or less than normal. Uh, I am eating more or less than normal. I don't get pleasure from the things I used to get pleasure from. I got brain fog. I can't think anymore. I, I am fatigued. I feel like somebody sucked the life out of me. Or like for men, they're much more irritable than they used to be. So there are, are very cl clinical signs and symptoms. Signs, I identify them. Symptoms, you know, that, that, that these are internal processes that are very, very different. And there's that negativity when you hear people talk. There's that worthlessness, the self-criticism, the self-denial. Uh, these things make people very different than just being in a funk. And there's that dysfunction that you'll see that they're not performing like they used to. They don't have that energy like they used to. Uh, the cognitive skills are depleted. Uh, 
sleeping is a big deal. That's really where our brain gets cleaned up and refurbished and ready to go. It's kind of like, you know, sleep is great for our brains. It cleans it up. But when we're dysfunctionally sleeping, when you're depressed, you end up having this brain fog and cognitive skills. All the cognitive skills end up being depleted and uh, we end up sluggish. And it's obvious at work in terms of our tasks. We are emotionally fragile. We, we might be tardy and uh, take forever to get our job done. Just simply, you, you walk someplace and you have no idea what you were doing there, or you forgot what was happening because your cognitive skills have depleted. When you look at national trends, or you look at history in the treatment, uh, the, the long history of psychiatry, going all the back, way back to Sigmund Freud, uh, certainly we have become, as a, a culture, more aware. And, the, you know, movies, TV, you know, every 10 minutes on TV, there's a commercial about a new antidepressant. So, and it gives you all the signs and gives you the picture of the person, what they look like depressed, and they take the med, and now they're happy and skipping and singing. So, we certainly have an awareness, and I think that's the big thing. But I, I think the prevalence hasn't changed. What I think has changed is suicide, and that we have a significant difference and lower suicide today than we did 50 years ago because of the medications we have. People always ask me, well, what did people do 50 years ago when they didn't help all this? Well, they were dead. They didn't, they didn't make it. So I think it's very important that if you have a friend or a coworker start slipping into depression and you start noticing some of these symptoms, that you engage that conversation uh, about how are you doing, you know, you don't seem like yourself, that kind of thing, because the, the real dangerous uh, depression is the suicide. And if people start having conversations about being hopeless, or they just don't see an answer, or they just can't break through. And sometimes what I've noticed, it's not as much bad feelings, they don't feel anything. You know, to me, one of the most dangerous things for people to get to is just feeling empty. They feel nothing. They feel like a zombie. They don't feel alive inside. And when people get that dark, they start getting hopeless and that's a very dangerous path if you're beginning to believe hopeless thoughts and you're starting to get dark like that uh you need to reach out uh i would and reach out to anybody talk to your pastor talk to your primary care physician talk to your best friend and start seeking help because typically this is not going to resolve on its own I think Dr. Jeff Baker did a great explanation as far as giving the, the root cause of what depression is and also giving the symptoms that are involved. Now also keep in mind that not everyone experiences the same symptoms. They can vary. And um, I think the important thing about this is you have to be aware of your emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. There were several things Miss, I really enjoyed about the video. One of them was the attitude that um, Dr. Baker approached the topic. He approached it very matter-of-factly. There were even times when he laughed. And um, I think that we need to be aware of the fact that, yes, we're having a down day. And yes, we are depressed. You know, it's OK to, to say that. Um, but then when you say it, you recognize the fact that um, there's no harm you know, the kids say, no harm, no foul. Yes, we are depressed. Now, I'm aware of it. Now, what do I need to do? So uh, you made a, a good point as far as acceptance. A lot of people have a hard time accepting that at that moment they feel weak. Mm -hmm. Or is this, they're not really aware of how to feel at that, at that moment in time. And being aware of again, your emotional intelligence is very important when you're dealing with this particular issue is because you never know. Um, one day you could be fine and 
everything is smooth sailing and the next day you don't understand why you, you can't even get out of bed or not even want to take a shower or brush your teeth. So being aware can lead you to the next step, which is communicating to someone, you know what, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. I am not okay. Mm -hmm. And you know there are there are there is with some people a stigma with mm -hmm. with being depressed. They feel that um, people are th will think that they're quote crazy, and that's not mm -hmm. it. That's not it at all. And sometimes even in our churches, uh, we'll we'll wonder if the church will accept us, or if they'll see that oh yeah they've got mental problems. Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't exactly. have some kind of issues? Exactly. But the point is that uh, we need to learn to accept each other the way we are. That's exactly, I think, what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to, to love each other. Mm -hmm. He wants us to accept each other. And then when there are issues, just be honest about it. We need to be able to love our brothers and sisters enough and feel comfortable enough to say, you know, I'm a little down today. I really am kind of depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and even go so further and say, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what to do. And then that's when we need to step in in love and say, you know, what can I do for you? Exactly. And that's important when you're on the receiving end of that. A lot of right. people miss where sometimes we're so focused on responding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with an answer. And sometimes there's no answer. It's just listening yeah. to the person. Yeah. And I just wanted to read this scripture um, that kind of ties in all of this, mm -hmm. which is taken out of Galatians 6, mm -hmm. um, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Going on to 2, bear ye one another's burdens, mm -hmm. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Maybe there's not, quotes a right answer. I'm not sure that there is a right answer for everybody mm -hmm. because the reasons for depression are vastly different. Um, it can go from one extreme to the other. But I really believe in all my heart that Jesus wants us to accept each other, validate each other, that, mm -hmm. you, that you are, you're, your issues are worthy of my attention. Mm -hmm. They're worthy of us discussing. And then let's come together and let's, first of all, let's pray about it. Ask Jesus to, to show us what to do. Mm -hmm. And then don't let go of that person. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what we were talking about, isn't it? Exactly. And that's exactly, um, we've got instructions, so we know we're okay. Exactly. <laughs> and, we ought to, and there's not a person on this earth who doesn't have a burden. Because we all have sinned. We come from parents of sin. But, but, we have a sin bearer. And while we love, we love our brothers and sisters, we need to point them to Jesus because that's where we can't bear their sins. But Jesus bears a sin and he gives us hope. Exactly. And that's what we need to focus on. Right. Because there may be times when we're by ourselves and maybe there's nobody close by or nobody we can call or we can always call on Jesus. We can always call on the name yes. of the Lord. Yes. yes, that's exactly right. God is always there. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't feel comfortable praying, and that's okay. Yeah. But seek help, whether it's a loved one, a close friend, even going to your local church and asking someone for help. Yeah. Seek help. Yeah. That's important. And if those resources fail you, there are always is an 800 number, a national 800 number to call. There are also um, our local numbers of people to call. The point is, just don't feel like you're alone. Don't feel as if there is no answer. The only answer is just if you sit there and wallow and be depressed. No, no, there is hope. So that leads into as far as coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. What can we, what can you do? What can I do if I'm feeling down? And um, just wanted to get into just a, a few things here. I think the, the most um, or the best thing that we can do is get active, be intentional about getting up and yes. moving, mm -hmm. whether it's taking a walk. Um, I know that people are iffy about going in, into gyms or just do something in your living room, mm -hmm. exercise, get 
get moving. You have to sometimes force yourself to get moving. Yes, I would even suggest that um, start your day out putting yourself on Jesus' side because we and saying to him, um, well, first of all, praising his name for who he is, and then being very honest with him and saying, you know, I need you today. I'm not sure what today is going to bring. I'm not sure what to say, but Lord, you know, I don't, yesterday was a little bit difficult for me. I need you. And then find something that's positive to read. Find a Bible text or a promise. And in fact, I would say, be bold. Find a promise that suits you and your situation. Say it out loud, pray it out loud, and then tell God that he cannot lie. Because he cannot lie, Lord, I know that you're going to help me. And wait and see what God does. And I would suggest you even start a journal. Mark the date. Mark the date mm -hmm. that you even found that promise and you asked the Lord to, to bless you. And I then, like the Lord, journal Lord. idea. That's, yeah, that's, that's really cool. great. Because that helps you to set goals. Yes. Also, it helps you to understand this is not going to be just a quick turnaround for right. you. Right. This is going to be a gradual movement in your life mm -hmm. to get to a better place. And sometimes when we put a date beside a prayer request or a promise, we'll go on, we'll say, oh, the Lord answered that. And we'll go on and, and sometimes the Lord will bring us back to that date maybe even weeks or months later, and say, you see what I did for you? And you realize that you have forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yes, God had answered that promise that day, yes. but he answered it the, pre the next week, the next month. Mm -hmm. But God brings us back to, to let, him, let us know he's not forgotten us. Exactly. And I think that will also will uh, strengthen and encourage our faith. And so when depressing times come, we can exercise, we can have morning worship, but we can also go back and see where God has helped us Absolutely. in the past. And that helps to lessen the depression. It lessens the feeling or the idea that we're all by ourselves because we're never by ourselves, ever. Absolutely. That's, that was a great point. You can Straight always go back. Spirit, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You want to learn how to be intentionally happy. Again, we're not saying that this is going to be an easy road, but it's taking baby steps to get to a certain point where you can fight mm -hmm. for that day. In fact, Melissa, I think our next video uh, starts out with some people who talked about being depressed and said, oh, no, I've got to do this and do that. I don't need to stay in that state of depression. So Yes, the next video has some very good testimonies yes. of individuals who have struggled. And also they uh, describe or tell us what they do each day yes. to overcome. Mm -hmm. Amen. Today is a good day. I'm feeling good. I know I can get in here and get these endorphins going. Let's go in here and let's lift some weights. <laughs> How are you today? All right, and you? Good. Thank you, ma'am. Some days you have to put on a mask because some days with my depression, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling good. It's like you just feel just this, not darkness, but you know that it's there. It's just taking over your body. Not seeing the light, not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. For me, it wasn't in any kind of life is not worth living, but something about not being able to see the bright side of anything. Even though you have the experience in the past that says it's probably going to be okay, right, based on the data. But at that time, just the, it's the, the feelings and the thoughts are overwhelming about how you don't see how this is going to end up okay. Some days I don't feel like uh, brushing my teeth. I don't feel like combing my hair. I don't feel like taking a shower because it takes too much effort. It's like even lifting my arm, it's like it weighs 100 pounds. And yet, somebody asks you, how you doing today, Fonda? And you just smile and say, I'm doing fine, but you're not fine. You're not fine. Grew up in a good Christian home, mom and dad, two sisters, one brother, youngest. 
family was huge for us. Family was huge for my dad because he was gone on most of the weekdays and he'd get back Friday, Saturday. So it was huge for him. That's why the second he got home, he wouldn't even change out of his suit. He was just like, all right, let's, let's start doing whatever everybody else is doing. Looking back now, when I was 11, uh, my life, I had never been exposed to trials. Like in my head, my dad is still a superhero. My dad and my mom are invincible. I was still very much of a kid. So I um, walk in the hospital room and I see my dad in the bed and then directly told us he had cancer, a stage four brain tumor. And my dad, I'd, I'd seen my dad cry maybe three times in my life before this. And then it was every day he would just cry and he would cry. And seeing my dad just be torn apart by cancer, it was finally hitting me that it, it might be something that he's really not gonna win. I had a baby at 16 years old. I named her Rachel Michelle, and she ended up dying a month later. She was born in July, and she died in August because her lungs weren't fully developed. I did not know a person could cry so much they had no tears. I suffered a traumatic incident, but yet you just we just went on. Nobody asked me, was I OK? Nobody tried to see if I needed any help. They just were like, OK, you lost the baby. Go on. The story starts really when I'm growing up in Puerto Rico. The way that people spoke about mental health issues was not necessarily flattering. It was almost in a mocking type of a way of, you know, that guy's nuts. You know, it was in Spanish, so the equivalent of that, está loco. And, and how it was kind of something that was fair game to be made fun of. So, you know, I didn't notice that at the time. But in hindsight, I look at it and I go, well, that might be the reason that I didn't speak about it. Depression is different for everybody and it's prevalent, right? You're likely to know somebody that is dealing with some mental health issue. Within 11 days, I lost my dad and my grandfather. So I remember immediately, I, I just went up to my room. I, I sat there and I, I remember praying to God that just let me cry, let me get this out, let me, because I, I thought if I could cry, it just the pain would go away. And my whole family is coping in, in much better than I was, so it seemed. And you know, they were falling back on God and they were trusting God while I was, I, I couldn't hear God, I couldn't trust him. Uh, and, and it didn't make sense to me, it was how could I trust him? And then depression, I, I just let it take over. And then it turned into escape. And it was okay, how can I get away from this? Because God won't help me. I was just done. So I remember we had pills from my dad and I and I was like, okay, well this is, you know, I'm, I'm okay with life ending now. I'm just gonna go be with my dad, be with my grandpa. And I woke up the next morning. I'm thinking, man, I, I can't even kill myself. And I can't even do anything right. So I tried again the next night. Uh, and I took even more than I did the first time. And as a 13-year-old kid, 14-year-old kid, you know, shouldn't have lived through it. And I remember waking up the next morning, and I just started bawling. I was like, I should have been dead, and I'm not. I was like, so obviously, there's a reason. And, and I remember just the feeling of, of it's gonna be okay. And and not that the depression would be taken away, but that I wouldn't feel like I was fighting alone anymore. Mental health affects us all. It does not discriminate. Everybody hurts, everybody loses something, everybody struggles. One in five people in the United States are likely to experience some sort of mental health problem in the course of a year. When people do seek help and get help and they use the skills they're learning, they learn how to think differently about what they're dealing with, they can improve their ability to enjoy life. It is very common in physical illness as well as mental illness to find that there are people further up the family tree who are experiencing or have experienced something like you have. 
It is so important to know your family history. Just like people don't mind their family history with cancer, diabetes, we need to know our family history when it comes to mental health. I know it's an uncomfortable subject, it's not a warm and fuzzy subject, but it's an important subject and it can save a life. I had another baby, I had Wesley in 1983, and I was so, uh, extremely holding on to him because of the fact that, you know, I had lost one and he just became my, my life. I love her mom, you know, that's my rock and, you know, she's always been there for me and I know she, she is the person I know that I can count on in my life, like no matter what. I have a mom who went through a divorce and sank into a pretty deep depression. You know, in hindsight, I can tell that. You know, to her credit and, and part of what formed my consciousness around mental health, she did go get help. We need to find a way as a society, but even as, as an individual, you need to find a way to switch and shift your thinking to it's okay. It's okay to need help. And it's a good thing to get it. My biggest prayer is that people will accept that it's, it's okay to hurt. Because the more you act like it's not, the more you will hurt. And that is just a dangerous path, just a dangerous road. In high school, there's definitely a huge stigma of acting like you're okay, acting like depression doesn't affect you. And, and I think it's sad because, especially for guys, you know, we're told to be strong and, you know, that kind of culture of, you know, don't cry, don't, you know, play sports and you can get hit and get right back up, you're fine, rub dirt on it. Um, so whenever you're affected mentally, I think you think the same thing. How wrong is that, that the culture we've created that people can't raise their hand and say that, yeah, I'm hurting and I need help. Today is not a good day. Hopefully tomorrow will be better, but I'm not gonna kid myself as well. They're not all good days. They're not all good weeks. You just have to take them as they come. And as each day comes, you gotta try to make the best of each day. So that's what I try to do. I don't sugarcoat things. I don't try to force things. I just try to take it one day at a time. When we diagnose a mental illness, there are certain criteria that you meet. To be clinically significant, it has to cause problems in your life for your ability to function in some way. Because a lot of people experience those same things at a lower level. But when they reach that level where it's beginning to impact their daily lives for a long enough period of time, then it would warrant a diagnosis. One of the key components that I work with people on is developing a healthy routine, healthy habits, good sleep patterns, appetite or, or nutrition or diet, you know, those things affect people in big ways. Exercise is a big factor in improving mood and helping people, you know, do better physically and mentally. Growing up, my whole family always played sports. Someone was always playing sports, so sports was huge for us. The therapy of just going and being in a gym by myself, um, and I'm naturally an introvert, so I love being in the gym by myself, just being able to shoot by myself, just let my mind be free, not think about anything, just, uh, just play. I do have a hope for the community, and it's that we can talk about mental health like we talk about physical health. My situation is unremarkable and non-dramatic as I think that it is, that, that it's good for people to kind of see that depression can take that form. So, you know, what I would tell somebody who's feeling helpless is that there is help. There is help out there. It is possible to feel better. If you're afraid to take the next step, you just take the first step. Even if that first person is your physician, it's a softer handoff than calling the practitioner. Although we don't mind if you just call us. If we as a community, whether that's church community or just our community in general, if we can welcome and embrace the idea that this does affect so many people and there's something that can be done, very hopeful that that's gonna make a difference. My depression is a battle every day. Um, you know, I, I know I have it and it's never gonna go away. I just learned to 
outsmart it a lot of days. I learned how to outsmart it and uh, it's always sitting on my shoulder. It's always there. It's always telling me, hey, I'm right here with you. But just because it's with me, it doesn't mean it's going to beat me. My biggest step was accepting the fact that, okay, I, I have chronic depression. It's not going away. And I think whenever you can admit that it's something that doesn't go away, it it becomes a lot more easier to, to deal with. And I know that uh, if my dad were here, he could have told me that life may suck sometimes. And a lot of times it's to the point where I don't even want to do it anymore. And sometimes the fight's going to hurt. At the end of the day, we're going to win. That was such a power, powerful video. Yes. I'm glad that um, people were willing to express their um, battle and also their triumph over it as well. Yes. And again, reiterating that every day you have to try to do better. Every day is, is going to be a struggle, but being intentional mm -hmm. about your purpose for that day, being intentional to get up and say, you know what, not today. That's right. Right. Not today. So I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to make sure I get up and be with my family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I just think that is just wonderful. It is wonderful. One of the things I noticed is that um, many of the testimonials touched on the eight laws of health. If you use the acronym New Start, N is nutrition, making sure that you have a healthy diet. Um, if you eat a lot of white flour, sugar, your, your, your immune system's gonna be off, you're gonna be hyped up, then you're gonna be depressed. Because once that sugar high drops, it drops below where you were initially. The next one at New Start is E, exercise. And I'm gonna go move, I'm gonna, and that's excellent. That's, mm -hmm. Those are excellent um, resources. So making sure you try to get at least 15 minutes of exercise at least five times a week. The next letter in New Start is W, so it's water drinking as the, water, the amount of water we need, and we say at least eight glasses of water a day. We don't realize it, but if we want our body to continue to function, but if it can't move the nutrients, if, if it can't get rid of the poisons, and the only way it does that is through blood flow. If you don't have enough water, then the blood flow is gonna be sluggish. So you need to make sure you have adequate water. The next letter in New Start is S, and I think S stands for sunshine. Now we're in Michigan. And during the winter months, it's kind of hard to do that. And so during the summertime, it's not an issue. But from December, say, until March, or during those cold months, it is it's kind of difficult. hard to get those, um, those minutes that we need in the sun. In fact, seasonal depression is an issue, a very real issue in those northern, uh, northern um, states. But you can still get it. For example, one thing you can do is actually open your front door dress a little warmly, open yes. the front door and sit in the sunshine. Yes. That's perfect. Yep. You can still go outside and walk in the wintertime. Uh, the next letter in the word, the acronym New Start is T. You want to make sure that you're temperate. You want to make sure that you're not um, doing extremes mm -hmm. one way or extremes the other way because then your body feels off kelter. And yes, you will, when, when the, you will feel depressed, especially when the pendulum swings yes. and uh, you're overly tired. So then after T is the letter A. The letter A stands for air. You want fresh air, not secondhand air. So one of the things I hear people say is that they always keep their windows cracked open. Yes, even here in Michigan, crack that window up at least a, uh, an inch or two at night so you can have fresh air going through. So you won't be breathing stagnant air. And that's important. If you get outside and exercise, perfect. The next letter in the word new start is a letter R, and that stands for rest. You know, there was a time when even Jesus told the disciples, it's time for us to come apart and rest a while. We all need to rest. And so even during the day, if you're busy, and I know the, the, the job that I have, you know, I'm not going to, you just don't have time to rest. But I make a point of having at least 20 minutes during the day that I can just stop, put my feet up, and just relax. And then you want to make sure that you have at least eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. 
for some people that's kind of hard. But, and we won't spend a lot of time on uh, discussing that now, but go online and look and see the things that you can do to make sure that you get adequate rest, making sure the lights are out. Um, for some people, it's going to bed earlier. But just make sure you get adequate rest. Your brain needs it. Your heart needs it. And they both function 24-7. So the next thing in the acronym is T. And that stands for trust in God. We yes. always, no matter what we do, we need to trust in God because whether we're very being temperate or whether we're very intemperate, we need God's help to do the right things. We can't yes. do those on our own. Yes. We can try, but we will always fail. And the Lord will turn our hearts to, so that we'll want the things that are healthy for us. Mm -hmm. um, if we're intemperate in a certain area, He will make it so that our wants come closer to where they should be. So new start. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. Praise God. Thank you for joining us this morning as we discuss the topic of depression. We know that times have been hard, especially during uh, COVID, but there is hope. Continue to stay in prayer mm -hmm. and ask God for discernment as you evaluate your own depressive state or your friend's depressive state. Mm -hmm. Ask for guidance and thank you again for being with us. I also want to thank you. Um, I've had a good time, Melissa. I enjoy the videos. I think I've been helped by it. And we want to remind you that um, tonight, the further discussion. So come back and join us. We'd love to have you. We want to thank you for tuning in to our mental health series. We pray that you have been blessed. And we want to encourage you to join us on Thursday nights at 7.30 p.m. And if you haven't registered, please register so that you can receive your free book by June Hunt on the topic depression. Register now while supplies last. God bless.